you, Liz, for that kind invitation. I'll just start my time, and even though um, I'm technically her boss or her boss's boss, she'll stop me if I talk too long. So um, I was asked when I came in, why is there a, that beautiful picture? Well, that's Lord Howe Island, and in a week's time, I'm going to be there. So I thought it will just raise my spirits, if not yours. I acknowledge that I'm standing today on Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation, but we are coming from many different Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands, lands which have never been ceded. And I pay my respects to all First Nations people and emerging of the future. So in my time, I wanted to take you through three things. And the main message is, if I can do it, you can do it. But I wanted to say, why would you even undertake health and medical research, whatever your craft group or core degree? My own clinician scientist journey, which is really just to show you it isn't a straightforward path. And there's things I've learned along the way and that I hope, you know, maybe some insights for you. Just some thoughts about what are some strategic research opportunities now, because I think it's really critical to use your time well and to think about research of the future and just some concluding thoughts, a number of which will depend how much time I've got left. So why invest in health and medical research? Well, the goal is to deliver better health outcomes. And there's been a lot of work uh, done both by the academy and many learned societies, including the Australian Association of Medical Research Institutes, amongst others, to show the benefit of health and medical research to funders, to government, to policyholders, to the community. One is for Australia, we get important knowledge gain. Uh, and there's been life changing discoveries through Australian researchers, some of which are shown here, one of whom is Eddie Holmes. For those who don't know, he's actually a University of Sydney professor, a scientist. He actually sequenced. COVID-19 and has shown important genetic pathways and that led not only the information for vaccines and for diagnostic medicines as well. Really interesting to hear his podcast. Also there are some important people who led to the discovery of rubella virus as a cause that actually influences fetal development and leads to consequences including my PhD supervisor Margaret Burgess then Margaret Mensal. Another reason is that it actually benefits our communities. So there are clear improvements for health services by entities like Sydney Local Health District that undertake health and medical research. And there's been clear evidence of improvement in total adjusted life years, and you can quantify that. It also benefits our economy. So um, there was work done by the NHMRC that showed for every dollar invested in health and medical research, actually there's $3 return of benefits or savings to our community. It also makes us, our health system, a safer, uh, more efficient health system, things such as improving not only the safety and quality of practice, but also by attracting the brightest minds to our health system to undertake not only clinical service, but also health and medical research. And we identify problems to our own healthcare. We identify solutions to our own healthcare problems. So that's why I think you're in the right audience. You should continue a career as a health and medical researcher. So what about my journey? So I actually started my training to be a paediatrician in what is now a beautiful uh, apartment building down the road. It was the old Royal Alexandra Hospital for Children. There weren't a lot of opportunities, even though I did six years of paediatrics there, little bits of research, but not a lot. And in fact, to continue my specialty training as a paediatrician in infectious diseases, I had to go overseas. I went to Boston. I was very privileged to be at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And there I was really trained to do research as well as clinicians. That's what everyone did. You were, that was what you did. You know, you identified questions and you trained in research methodology. I actually did a laboratory-based PhD in Sydney, discovering viruses and uh, genetically manipulating them so that they could be used for vaccines. And I was using a herpes model. Um, and then had a babe, uh, a little American, came back to Sydney because I really wanted to continue my career here in Australia uh, and was employed at the Children's Hospital, which had moved out west and Sydney Uni. And I had the privilege of being 
uh, employed as a clinician scientist. So not only doing clinical work, but also doing research. Spent some time in Melbourne as their chair of paediatrics, running their academic health centre before being lured back to Sydney um, to be the head of school and dean of the medical school. An important thing though, there's always been barriers. So uh, for a lot of these, I've been the first woman in the role. This was uh, the Stevenson's Chair of Paediatrics that's been going since 1962, first woman on International Women's Day. And also the first head of school and dean of Sydney Medical School. And Robin Ward is our first female um, executive dean and first dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health. But my research has been in four key areas. I'm just going to give you a highlight of these. One is the uh, pathogenesis of herpes viruses. Sorry about the slide. The main thing I learned here is just the fundamental rigour of undertaking laboratory research. And the, the work that I was taught was, you know, plan your work, you know, and work your plan. So not prejudging what you're going to find, but actually looking at results and seeing what is interesting. And actually, that's where you make the greatest discoveries. So things that I'd found was just the use of these genetically modified viruses for vaccines, which are only just now coming into patent, ironically, um, that the virus was causing this type of cell death and actually using very fluorescent strains were infecting types of immune cells in the skin that was triggering immune responses. And I had wonderful postdocs there. Coming back to Australia, though, my clinical interest had always been the transmission of viruses from mother to child. And so using a wonderful mechanism that Ms. Elliott set up for the Australian Paediatric Surveillance Unit, we undertook study of uncommon but important conditions around the country using world-leading surveillance methodology actively to uncover things such as uh, the importance of a very devastating infection of herpes virus passed from mother to child or consequences and frequency of congenital rubella infection. But then I was also very interested in emerging viruses, particularly those of the brain. And actually, one of I have an amazing PhD student who is the son of the next speaker, Philip Britton. Uh, and we set up a, a study of childhood encephalitis nationally, the Australian Childhood Encephalitis Study, and using again incredible mechanism called the Pediatric in, uh, Enhan Active Enhanced Disease Surveillance with APSU and the National Centre for Immunisation Research, set up best practice in identifying prospectively severe cases of childhood encephalitis that were admitted to hospitals and then characterising those. And we found some incredible things such as we actually described uh, an important epidemic of something called human parechovirus. We also so showed that things such as influenza virus can actually cause uh, an encephalitis-like syndrome with significant disability and mortality to children, which hadn't been previously quantified. And that was very important and informing vaccination policy for the under fires for influenza. Also some really interesting work with Eddie Holmes and others about viruses that uh, in, uh, infect horses causing encephalitis as well. And the consequences. So these uh, brain infection and inflammation at the time, the child doesn't look unwell, but there are important neurocognitive consequences that are lifelong. And how do we uh, prevent those and how do we manage those? But importantly, another key thing that I'm doing now is actually developing the ne next generation. So that is my prime purpose, not to lead my own studies, but to participate in other studies and really bring on the next generation of postdocs and PhD students as well. And again, um, there's been a lot of work done by AMRI and others showing the importance of this investment in the next generation of health and medical researchers such as yourself. And I'm glad you're here today. So strategic areas of medicine. Translation. Oh, sorry. I'm Siri. So a key area is we generate a lot of new knowledge, but what we don't do is put it into practice and put it into practice at scale. So developing skills in implementation science, I think, is a really important method for the future for a clinician researcher. Secondly, we've all undertaken clinical trials using the traditional double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials, but with data science now, there are these novel methods of adaptive clinical trials using data where 
you, um, the original problem and methodology uh, is refined as you go through. And, and Tom Snelling uh, from the University of Sydney is an expert in this, as are many others around the world. And this is a really important skill I would suggest if anyone is interested in clinical trial methodology, particularly in the community, particularly in primary care, where there's a population that we simply don't reach and study, which is important both for prevention and um, you know, keeping people healthy and in the home. And this is also using things such as precision medicine and genomics in these trials as well. Precision medicine, so the very idea that we're using you know, genetic information about and other information about individuals to tailor that therapy. At the moment, you know, we give therapy based on a, a very blunt diagnosis of a particular condition. And that means that possibly half the people, you know, who are given a medication, actually it, that's the right medication for them. For some people, it's absolutely wrong medication. For example, people who might not metabolise that drug in the liver, or for some, it doesn't work. The classic example here is in cancer immunotherapy, I'm sure lots of people will be telling you that today, but very much, you know, it's transformed the notion of um, melanoma therapy, for an example. Um, so this, again, using precision medicine to tailor um, that therapy for people will be important moving forward. And clearly we're in an age of uh, artificial intelligence and digital health, you know, maybe we'll all be replaced by about GPT, I don't know. Um, I, I read some work about um, today, there's the, the next iteration, I think, that's going to be taking out, you know, the role of, um, you know, middle-class women. So, you know, I'm looking for my next job, if anyone's got any idea. No, I'm only joking. But using AI and digital health is going to be a very key tool that yourselves as the next generation of health and medical researchers needs to understand. But very importantly, a lesson that's taken our community a long time to learn is that actually when we're designing, even thinking about undertaking research, the very stakeholders that, that are going to be the benefits of this research should be involved right from the start in conceiving what's important to them. So examples I've seen of this are even with encephalitis of what I thought was really important as outcomes, those who are people who have experienced encephalitis and have consequences have a very different view. So having um, stakeholders, consumers involved in a very equal partnership in the concept of research, in the design of research, in the implementation is really important not only to actually make sure we translate the research, but that it is respectful and benefits uh, the community that we're undertaking. And this is especially true for particular groups, including our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities uh, and other culturally and linguistically. Um, diverse group. So some closing thoughts. Any research we do must be the best design and be ethical. So this is uh, the former uh, chief scientist, Alan Finkel, who was talking about justifiable research priorities. So as a, as a community, nationally, globally, what are our, we've got a very limited resource. And so anything we do spend money on, we're taking it away from something else. So we really need to think, what are the most important things we need to do? Not necessarily always the most common, as you know, Liz and I have studied rare diseases, but what is important and why? And really, this is where your research training and continue to train and develop your skills to have the best research design, conduct and analysis. So many findings have come through and have really been wrong when reanalyzed apart from academic integrity. And that's also managing our conduct and proportionate to the risk that we're undertaking. I put this slide up because in the United Kingdom, there are very clear academic pathways for people who have health degrees, um, but other degrees in, and this is just showing an example for medicine, but any health degree, in then having a very clear pathway for training uh, as a clinician researcher. There's much we need to think about. This system isn't perfect though. So what I hear from our colleagues in the UK is they just get further along the track and then they're trying to find a job. One of the things we're doing here at the University of Sydney is really trying to invest in our incredible early and mid-career researchers and academics. Um, 
to, to give them very clear pathways to university. So here's some final tips. Don't be put off by criticism. Uh, in 2018, I was elected as a fellow of the Academy and I'm a council member, but my very first NHMRC grant. So in these days, you put in a grant. I was the sole investigator. The scores, I think, were out of seven. I had one reviewer who, now one is bad, okay, um, who said basically put me one across the board and so shows no aptitude for research. So um, as uh, one of my colleagues said, you can't be a cream puff. You're going to get some negative reviews and you just have to learn from that and think strategically. The second is manage your time. The most precious resource you have is your time. So that means thinking about if you're balancing it with a clinical career, how do you actually cordon off time for your life as well as your clinical career, as well as your research? But make sure you're doing something, if you're doing research that's important to you, that really motivates you and um, learn how to manage your time well. And you don't have to say yes to every talk, you know, use your time well. Find good mentors. Uh, and these are some people, so David Knight, who was my laboratory supervisor in Harvard Medical School, Margaret Burgess, um, world-leading um, immunisation expert, Tanya Sorrell, world-leading infectious diseases, um, mycologist, and Catherine North, who was a colleague, but again, an incredible mentor in terms of managing the various parts of clinician scientists' careers. Find many mentors and they will change throughout the career and learning that the advice they give you are still the person who is best able to think what works for you. So there's many different perspectives from many different backgrounds. The more you get, the more you can then choose what advice you'll take. Channel your inner Jacinda Ardern. So she's a courageous leader um, and as I'm uh, in, a, in a different leadership roles, I really think it's important to be an authentic uh, and brave leader. Um, we're all imperfect individuals. None of us are perfect. So if you're standing up here thinking, you know, you're hearing from people who are, you know, amazing, we're all not, actually. We just work hard and we're very passionate. So confront reality, seek feedback, say what needs to be said, but encourage people to give you feedback, you know, respectfully. Uh, communicate openly and free, freely, leading change, make decisions and move forward, always give credit and attribute and take care of yourself and be accountable. And finally, identify things that make you feel good, that lift you up. For me at, at the moment, it's ocean swimming, um, but I do do a lot of reflection and think, how do I um, manage this busy life um, and, and really taking time to reflect on my family and what's important to me and trying to keep well. So what I've said to you today is that health and medical research um, is very important for yourselves, but for the community. Uh, clinician scientists are the key to the future and really to look for some strategic opportunities um, in research when you're making your choice. Thank you. So and I'm sort of acknowledging there'll be people from many different craft groups, not just physicians. Um, I think whenever is right for you, there's no one right time. So some people have gone into their health degree um, with a PhD, some do it during, it's very hard. We find, you know, for certain medical schools, a postgraduate course, some people have been to and others, it's so packed, it's very hard. We do have a dedicated research block, but it's very hard to do that on top of your medical degree. Some people are able to do that. Um, and really it's about the right time in your life. You know, um, often you need to get your internship. It is. There's, a, there's never a right. The participant asked, can you please tell us more about overseas and how did you get that opportunity? So uh, I, I personally think it's great to go overseas to undertake some part of your career. I think it's just a life experience. And for me, living in Boston and seeing, you know, the Harvard medical community and the way they don't care about which institution you're from. They, you know, you could be at Harvard or MIT or 
Boston Uni, they all collaborate uh, and freely exchange and it's an incredible environment. So whatever you're doing, if you can find that opportunity, it's great. Um, there are many pathways. So there are NHMRC funded scholarships. I actually just reached out to a variety of units. It was partly because I was still doing specialty training that I wrote with that opportunity and having done some research and published before that stood me well. Um, but I think that actually use a mentor to get some advice, but take that opportunity. It could be in, you know, Asia Pacific in our region. There are many opportunities at Sydney uh, for any research. So just in the Faculty of Medicine and Health, I think we have some, you know, 300 high degree research students. We have um, multiple salaried staff and affiliates. Um, all of our, the majority of our health degrees have a dedicated research time, but we've also got a wonderful early mid-career research network with a lot of support now for grants, for uh, travel, you know, really to get people ready Get the NHMRC investigator salary grants now. It's really tough. So you need some development to get there. And not only when you first get it, but also there are other stages of your career. Almost the mid-career researcher, I think, is a really tough stage. Um, hi there. Thank you for the talk so far. Very inspiring. Um, I was curious about what made you want to go into pediatrics and also um, what made you interested in encephalophage. So what made me go into paediatrics, um, that was really through my medical training. You know, I just, I mean, I was one of those students that every term, term, time I did a term, I wanted to be whatever. And paediatrics wasn't the last. But um, I think that, uh, you know, it was just something that I found the whole culture of child health, you know, something that I really enjoyed. And as far as the um, identifying cephalitis, um, you know, it was one of these, uh, pieces of work. So it was partly thinking what was a really important area to identify of the next emerging infection and what are some of those signals? And one of them is this, you know, there's obviously severe pneumonias, you know, SARS-1 and, and COVID, um, some GI infections, but CNS infections. And, and when we looked at it, there really was a gap in what we knew nationally about this important infection. We have so many important, unique infections for this part of the world that we weren't capturing. So that was the trigger. But ironically also, um, my daughter, and she wouldn't mind me saying this, actually has an autoimmune encephalitis. So I've seen it um, from both angles now, but that wasn't part of the original thought. Thank you very much. Aria, I also have a question for you. Thank you very much again for the fantastic talk. If you could imagine yourself back as a medical student now, given your experience, would you still choose paediatrics or think of something else? Good question. Probably. Um, I think, though, um, other things, I really feel now that we have a major investment in primary care. And I think uh, thinking about how could I really get in there and prevent um, ill health, you know, and promote health and well-being, uh, if not paediatrics, it would be better practice and research in the Thank you. I think we have another question. Thanks for your talk today. I'm a medical student, and I guess a lot of what I'm seeing about your clinic career trajectory, a lot of it um, launched off the ground after perhaps you left medical school and a lot more scope afterwards. And it's a very exciting prospect to have. I'm trying to think as a medical student, what would be your top three things that you would recommend? invest a bit of our time in besides focusing on medical school just to give us a bit of footing when we leave something yep. to launch into so depending where you are um, there may be opportunities and certainly most of the medical programs all the medical genes are walking through so we all know and actually they're all good programs no, they're all really good but wherever you are a lot of the time there's an opportunity to do some research within your medical degree. So, so choose that well and think firstly about an area of interest in terms of 
you know, the health problem that you're trying to solve, but also where you might just get some skills. I think afterwards, you know, if you go through internship um, and you're going through whatever your chosen pathway, um, seeking to find, you know, an area of research where, again, there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, we're just crying out for people to continue to undertake research, you know, uh, in, in part-time salaried roles. So looking to see if there's ways you can combine that training once you've done your internship, you know, you've got to get through that. But in terms of your specialty training, if you're choosing that or waiting to get on to leave, there's many people who are undertaking part-time research degrees in Thailand as well. The main reason is not to get on this, another scheme, but to actually do something that you're interested in, um, you know, that's using your time. If I understand you, you're asking, you know, understand your content area and then do the research or do the research. And there's no one right way. I mean, COVID, you know, what a time we've lived and things we've learned. But actually, it's interesting you talked about face masks because one of the very big knowledge gaps that was out there is do they actually work? And so we've got a lot of good um, information and clinical trials done well on other public health measures including vaccines and physical distancing, but things like face masks and hand hygiene weren't done well. So I think that opportunity, you know, you can't always map the right time to do things. I think what I would say of what you've done is grab that opportunity because you'll learn the other important things on the way. And don't, you know, don't be rigid in thinking about, I've got to do it this way. I think life gets in the way, COVID gets in the way. Use these things as an opportunity. And sometimes be brave, take that shift in what you're doing. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I was wondering, so you've got a lot on your plate, right? You're like pediatrician, you're a researcher, you supervise students. How does a week in your life kind of look in terms of your kind of job out for each of your projects? So um, I think the main piece in that is to think, um, to really manage my time well. So I do get up every morning and think, what, what are the most, if not important or urgent, there's the urgent. If it's me, I do it, but otherwise I find the person to do it. But really to think, what am I going to achieve today? But also to put in that some self-care time. You know, I'm at the age where, you know, I'm just trying to maintain the muscles and the <laughs> the hip flexibility and avoid the you know the chronic diseases. So making sure I have some self time and family time, but then think um, you know really to use my time well, not to go down um, pathways of you know just doing more and more emails. So block out time if I've got research or something that I need to do. Be very clear about mapping in my diary that protected time with very clear instructions about when you know I can be contacted. When I'm doing clinical work, that has to be the top priority. And, you know, as a clinician, that's your priority. But I've got that, you know, fractionated to a day a week. You know, I have people under me to, to deflect things to, but I also build in that protected thinking time as well. And my holidays against Lord Howard. I always have one. So no day is the same. 
No, I've just come back from two days in Targi. You know. But they're wonder it's wonderful to do those things. So um, inspiration actually these days comes from, from my PhD students and postdocs, you know. Um, apart from what I do in my clinical practice, one of the other areas is to really step outside the box. So not simply listen to talks or uh, presentations from your own area. Some of the most interesting research that I've been involved with has been where it's really paradigm shifted with biomedical engineers or, you know, art historians. So I think firstly, think of something that you think this is really important and I'm interested in, but then try and seek um, some different ways of thinking about um, what could be a really interesting question to ask and then just check that no one else has asked this because frequently they have. The other thing, obviously, is, is the community and stakeholders. So having a community informed process of what matters to them, I think, is also 